Very good to be here at Faith Ward Baptist Church once again. I kind of feel like it's back home. It's been many years, but um, you see a lot of familiar faces, and, and I'm really glad and, and happy to be here this evening. Now, the sermon I prepared for tonight, um, I actually had a completely different sermon prepared, ready to go for tonight, and I kind of changed what I wanted to preach yesterday. And, you know, I was just kind of thinking uh, mostly about the, the youth in the, in the churches and fundamental Baptist churches and how, how kids can grow up in fundamental Baptist churches. But, you know, like, what's going to happen when, when, they, when they get old enough to leave and move out? Are they going to stick with the faith? Are they going to stick with what they're doing? Or are they just kind of coming here because they're forced to be here and their parents are bringing them here? You know, what are they going to do? And, and I kind of want to, I have a sermon that's geared for youth tonight. Now, everyone's going to be able to learn from this and be edified from this, and, and obviously God's Word applies to everybody, but I, I really, really want the kids to listen up today and just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to speak, I'm going to speak from the heart tonight, and, and I really want everyone to, to listen up, and especially the young people, you know, the, the people at this church, your parents that bring you here, they love you, they care about you. You know, you may not always understand the reason behind all of the rules, behind all the, the, the hard preaching. And, you know, out in the world, you, you may get some funny looks. And there might be people that are going to make fun of you because you go to this church and you've got your pastors on the news or whatever. And you might feel like, why do, why do you have to make such a big deal out of things? Why can't you just tone it down a little bit? You know, this is the things that kids might be thinking about. But... The reason why we make a big deal of this stuff is because we care about you. I care about you. I love you. Your parents love you. They want you to grow. And there's things I'm going to be talking about this evening, you know, that, that many of your parents and many of the older people here wished we would have had some of this information when we were growing up. I wish I would hear, I would have heard the hard preaching when I was younger, when I was your age. And please don't turn a deaf ear tonight. Please listen to the scripture, listen to God's word, listen to what I, I, you know, I'm pleading with you just to listen tonight. Give me your attention and try to take some wisdom with you that, you can, that can last with you for the rest of your life. Please don't have to learn through experience of going through some of the sins I'm going to be talking about this evening. Because it's only going to bring misery, sorrow, chastisement into your life, and you don't want to go through that. Amen. Trust me, you don't want to have to deal with that. Everything that we're going to be covering tonight, whether it sounds hard or not, is for your benefit. All the laws of God are for your benefit. Amen. God created us. God knows us. God wants us to live our best life now. <laughs> he wants us to live the life. And look, it doesn't come through just, you know, doing whatever you want. It comes through obeying and listening to God's word. He, he made us. He knows what we're like. He knows the lust of the flesh. He understands, you know, Jesus Christ became flesh. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. God knows. God knows what it's like to be human, especially young kids. Oftentimes, you know, children think, especially as you start getting into your teenage years, you feel like nobody understands. Nobody knows what I'm going through. You know, you have this tendency to feel, I know this because I was a kid once. And this is something that happens just generation after generation after generation. Kids always feel like nobody understands them. Listen to me tonight. We do understand. We do understand. You may have some variation of, of, of uh, circumstances in your life that bring you down some slightly different path, but at the end of the day, there's nobody that's gone through things that don't understand what you're going through. And regardless of any of your circumstances, it doesn't change the truth from God's Word. So please listen tonight and try to receive and apply whatever is going to apply to your life, which hopefully it all will, just, just take this in. And what I'm going to be covering is just a few different places where God's word is warning us. Beware. The title of my sermon is, is Warning Traps and Snares Ahead. There's a lot of traps, a lot of snares in this life. 
where whether it be Satan or just your own flesh is going to try to trap you and get you into situations that is going to cause just major problems for the rest of your life, potentially. We started off in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to quote Luke 12, 15 for you because the first trap that I want you to be aware of is covetousness. Luke 12, 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. possesseth. Jesus Christ is, is admonishing people, warning them, hey, don't get wrapped up in the cares of this world and the making money and just making your life all about how successful you can be in business, how much money you can make, how many things you can collect. That's a draw. That's a lust that people fall for. They waste their life. They spend their entire time just working and working and building up and just trying to accumulate as many things as they possibly can and set their eyes on the gold and the silver and the precious stones and the, and the money and all the, the mammon of this world. It's a, it's a facade. It's not going to bring you happiness. Don't fall for that. Look, it's important to work, especially young men. You know, get a job, be able to support yourself. But that's not why we're here. That's not the point. The point is about people. The point is about preaching. The point is about doing God's work. That's why we're here. 1 Timothy chapter 6 gives further warning on covetousness, where your eyes are just set upon things, being greedy, being, you know, after uh, uh, the wrong things that, that many people fall into. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 8. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Be satisfied. You got food, you've got clothing, and it looks like everybody that's sitting in the room tonight is wearing clothing. You look like you're clothed, so amen. Be content with that. And everybody probably had a meal today. Is there anyone that did not eat anything, unless you're fasting on purpose, that didn't have a meal today? Everybody had a meal today. Let's be content. Be content with that. Be happy. Be satisfied that God has provided your needs. You don't have to worry and be focused and dedicate your life into going so much further above and beyond what God's already provided you with. It's a trap. But I says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is a trap. It's, it's, it's uh, something that's there to, to, to trap you. And the Bible says they that will be rich. Will just means you want to be. If you have a desire like, oh, man, wouldn't it be great if I just had all this money and I could be rich and, and just do whatever I want and live comfortably? They that will be rich fall into temptation. And it doesn't say they might fall. It says they, basically they do fall. You have this desire and this want to, to be rich and to make all this money. And especially young people, you're trying to decide, what am I going to do with my life? Right? What direction am I going to take? You're in a position that... You know, a lot of adults, they don't have that same luxury anymore. You've kind of gone down a path already, and wherever you are, you know, it's not like you can't make any changes ever in your life, but it gets a lot harder once you're older, once you're established, you've been doing things for a while. When you're young, you've got everything in front of you. You've got an open book to write that is your life, and you don't want to spend that just focused on making a lot of money and just trying to get rich with the riches of this world because the Bible says you're going to fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Take God's word for what it says. Take it as the truth. Let it sink down in your heart. Don't allow yourself to become covetous after things that you don't have. Just be content with where you're at. Do the work you need to do, but set your mind on things that have eternal value. This is what, what the Bible is trying to teach us here. Look, turn, if you would, please, to Proverbs chapter 23. We're going to spend a lot of time in Proverbs tonight. I'm trying to impart wisdom, some of God's wisdom, unto you tonight. One thing that goes hand in hand with this covetousness and having a covetous attitude is beware of people that are trying to buy you. Don't be a sellout. People that might be enticing you and putting a whole bunch of money in front of your face. 
to go and, 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 and make some, some bad choice. And there's many ways you can do this. You can have people, you know, the people that want you to, to earn a whole lot of money doing something maybe that's immoral. Right? All, oh, all you have to do is just promote and market these filthy websites that, that promote smut and pornography. But here you could just make a whole bunch of money and they're going to flash you know, a whole bunch of money, six figures in front of your face. But all you have to do is, you know, lie or cheat or, you know, promote filth. Don't sell out for that. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, look at verse number 1. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. So in the context of the story, you're saying when you sit down with a ruler, so a ruler, you know, they're going to have a lot of, of wealth, right? Someone who's inviting you in, and they've got all this wealth, and they've got all these dainties and fancy food and all this stuff. He's saying, don't, don't be enthralled with that. Don't just be, you know, fallen or smitten with how much wealth this guy has. And when you sit down, he says, if you're someone who's given an appetite, you know, put a knife to your throat. Just, just hold back. Withhold yourself. Don't just indulge and get wrapped up into everything that this guy has. There's a warning here. And the Bible says, labor not to be rich. Yes, we have to work, but don't work just so you can have all this abundance that this, you know, that this ruler has that's in this story. Let's keep reading verse number five. Wilt thou set down eyes upon, thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. He's saying, the riches, they, you know, one of the reasons why you shouldn't just set your eyes on this is because they're going to go away anyways. It's just temporary. It's never going to last. The longest it could ever possibly last is however long you live on this lifetime. As soon as that's gone, it's gone forever. It just vanishes. It's up in smoke. And it probably won't even last that long. Verse number six, eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meat. So we're going back to where we started off this chapter with, you know, the wicked guy that's real wealthy, that's trying to invite you in and, and, and offer you all this stuff and offer you riches. He's saying, don't eat the bread of him that hath the evil eye. Neither desire thou his dainty meats. Don't be deceived by it. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. He's saying, oh, yeah, eat up. Here, I'm going to give you all this stuff. But he doesn't really care about you. He cares not about you at all. He cares about himself. And the only reason why you'd be sitting there is because there's some gain that he can have of you. Watch out for the people that are trying to buy you. Watch out for it. That could lead you down a bad path, a wicked path. Don't be deceived by someone who's flashing a bunch of stuff in front of your face. Look, if something's too good to be true, it probably is. You're going to learn that, that the things that are worthwhile at all in this life, you're going to have to work for. Don't go for the easy out, the easy money, this quick head start or whatever you think you're going to do. Because oftentimes, well-meaning people might think, oh, well, if I only sacrifice this one thing here and lose a little bit of my integrity, I could just use it further. I'll just do it this one time, and then I'll just get this head start, and then, then I'll start doing things the right way. Don't fall for that. As soon as you make that decision in your heart to, to go against God's word, to, to have a lapse in your integrity, it becomes all the more easy the next time and the next time and the next time and the next time. Don't think you're going to be stronger than you are at the very moment you're trying to make that decision. If you make the wrong decision, you're going to be way more likely to just continue down that bad path. Don't even consider it. And look, you don't have to listen to me tonight, but I'm just trying to warn you. All right, if you're, if you're wise, you'll listen and take heed. Listen to people that have been around way longer than you have. Think about this, kids. However old you are right now, divide your, your age in half. If you're 12, think of a 6-year-old. If you're 18, think of a 9-year-old, right? If you're 20, think of a 10-year-old. How much more do you know than someone that's half your age? Imagine having a conversation with someone half your age. How much more do you know? Do you think it would be wise for someone half your age to maybe listen to you? I'm 42 years old, kids. I've been around a while. Okay, I'm not the oldest one in this room. 
But as people get older, you learn a lot. Okay, and now not only do I have some age, but I've been reading and studying and listening to the Bible for a very long time. I have some wisdom to impart. Please don't turn a deaf ear. Verse number 8 there in Proverbs 23. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. In the end, it's not going to go well with you. Turn to, uh, you're in Proverbs chapter 23. Stay right there. I'm going to read for you from 2 Samuel chapter 13. This is another important point. There's a lot of important points, and these are all complete entire sermons of themselves. I'm going to try to, to wrap them in and tie them in as succinctly as possible in this sermon because they're all very important. The next point is about your friends, who you choose to spend your time with, who you choose to let in and, and be close with because the people that you spend your time with will influence you. Guaranteed, they are going to influence you, good and bad. The good things, the bad things, people are going to rub off on you. The Bible has a story in 2 Samuel chapter 13 of Amnon. Amnon had a friend that caused him to do, very famous, famous passage, caused him to do something extremely wicked. Where Amnon probably wouldn't have done something as wicked as he ended up doing, but it's his friend that influenced him. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 13, 1, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So Amnon has this, this emotion. He feels love for his sister, which he shouldn't have. And he knows he shouldn't have it. And that's why I say he thought it hard for him to do anything to her. He's not going to actually act on it. He knows it's wrong, he, he's been taught that it's wrong, but he has this feeling, but he's like, you know what, I don't think I could do anything about this because it's not right. But then steps in Amnon's friend, verse number three, but Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. He's sneaky, he's subtle, he's able to influence Amnon to do a really wicked thing and to take his sister and to act out what he knew was wrong, which he probably wouldn't have done at all if it wasn't for his friend's influence. Now, the fact that he's subtle is very telling because he didn't outwardly just seem like a wicked person. He probably had some stuff in common with Amnon. He became buddy-buddy with him. But because he's subtle, he's able to, to kind of sneak in and just influence him at the right time to cause him to do something that he normally wouldn't do. So watch out for your friends. People, people, look, you take after people, whether you realize it or not. There's so many, so many ways that this is true. And, and like I said, it may not always be for something bad. Uh, a, a, kind of a funny story in my life, and I, pro I might have told this before already here, I'm not sure. When I was much younger, I worked in a hospital and I worked in the, in the cooking, in the, in the uh, cafeteria, on the food line. And where the hospital was, it was in Chicago. And I worked with, with a lot of, of black people, okay? And the common language there was way different than what I speak, what I'm used to. And, you know, the, the, everyone who's familiar with Ebonics, okay, that, that, like, I'm not trying to be offensive here, but... The, 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 the culture, the way that, that people were talking there was way different. And, and just, just the language and, and the way that people spoke, you know, I started speaking like the people around me. I know, it's, it's kind of funny. Because if you were to look at me and then you hear the way I started talking, you'd be like, whoa. This white boy is saying things that, that doesn't sound like the way it should look, but um, that's just a result of being around people for extended periods of time. Yeah. You know, you pick up phrases, you pick up things, you know, things that people will say. I didn't, until I moved out to Arizona, I never said, right on. <laughs> never one time, not coming from Chicago, it's not something that's used. 
But the more you spend time out in, in other areas and around certain people, you pick up different things. Look, those might be some silly examples, okay? But it's a fact of, of who we are as people, just socially, when you're around other people, you are going to pick up things about them. And we need to be on guard about that in general in life, especially as you're out in the world. You know, we have to be out in the world. You have to work. I have to watch for this now at my secular job. I mean, the vast majority of people in my work, they're not, they're not you know, fundamental Baptist Christians. I don't know if anyone else is, but the things that they talk about, the things that they joke about, you know, those aren't things that I want to let myself get wrapped into. So should I go off and just start making best buddies with these unsaved people that just, just live, eat, breathe, and sleep the world? No. If I do, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to start getting into the same stuff that they're into. It's going to happen. The friends that you choose to have are going to cause you to some degree to go the direction that they're going. It's going to happen. So be careful with who you choose to allow into your life. You're in Proverbs 23. Jump down to verse number 26. The Bible reads, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. We're going to get into this in a little bit. She also lieth in wait as for a prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Now, I skipped over a verse in my notes here. Jump up real quick to verse number 19, because obviously we're reading about the effects of alcohol here in Proverbs 23. Just jump up real quick to verse number 19. The Bible says, Hear thou my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. And one of the things I love, just a side note, on the book of Proverbs, over and over and over again throughout the book of Proverbs, you see, you know, hear my son. This is, this is you know, the, the Solomon or whoever's writing the Proverbs, just addressing their son, right? Going, my son, just, just please get instruction. Please get wisdom. Please understand what I'm trying to tell you today. Hear thou, my son, and be wise. We want you to grow up. I want you to be wise. I want you to understand. I don't want you to go down the wrong path. Guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers. Don't be among, you know, you know, definitely don't make them your best friends, but don't be among people. Don't be hanging out with people who are just giving to drinking, drinking booze, drinking wine. Don't be among the wine bibbers. Nothing good is going to come of that. Don't be the person that says, oh, I'm not going to drink anything, but I'm still going to go out to the bar and hang out with my buddies. Don't be around that. That was, I, look, I've done it. When I quit drinking, I still never separated myself completely. Now, oh, I'm still going to go out to the bar. Look, you don't want to do that for many reasons. Nothing good happens, and as we're going to get into again, when you look at everything that happens as a result of alcohol, you don't want to be around the people who are indulging in that. The Bible says in verse 21, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. You want to end up being a deadbeat? and just come to rags and just flush everything you have down the toilet, go ahead and start hanging out with the wine bibbers. Go ahead and hang out at the local pub. You're going to flush your stinking life away for, for just some poison in a bottle. That's going to destroy your body anyways. You might as well flush your wealth down with it. The Bible says we're going to jump back down to verse number 29. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions? Drinking booze is going to bring you woe. The world's going to tell you that, oh, no, we have so much fun. This is great. It's a party, man. Woohoo! yeah, we're going to go get drunk tonight. That's what they're going to tell you. Don't be deceived by it. Don't let these people think, no, man, don't listen. Don't listen to that, that preacher. He doesn't know what he's talking about. We're going to go have some fun. 
This is cool, man. Come with us. Don't fall for it. It's not what, it's, what they're telling you it's cracked up to be. They're going to think you have so much fun. You know what's going to cause you to use? It's going to cause you to say stupid things. You're going to look like a bunch of fools because you got people laughing like idiots because someone says something stupid. That's what happens when people get drunk. It's really not that fun. On top of that, it's not going to bring you happiness. You think you're all happy. You, know, you see all these people, yeah, but these people, when they're drunk, they're all so happy. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. It lasts for a fleeting moment, but you know what comes after that? Whoa. Sorrow. Emptiness. It doesn't fulfill. The Bible says, who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? You know, there's a lot of fights that go on when people get drunk, too, for no reason. Someone, you know, there's people that go out to the bars just for the, just to look to get in fights. They get drunk because that, that builds up their, you know, their, their ego or builds, builds, puffs themselves up because they're probably cowards without it anyways. They got to get their beer muscles, right? And then they want to prove how tough they are and just, and just get into fights with people. Does that sound like fun? You just want to go out and get in fights with people for no reason at all? It's not fun. It's not cool. Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself right. God's trying to teach you, don't even look at it. Don't be among the people who are going out and getting drunk. Don't even look at the booze. Don't tempt yourself. Don't, don't, you know, when you're looking on it, you're going to be thinking about it. Don't even, don't even let it come into your mind. Avoid it completely. Verse 32, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Getting involved with booze is about as fun as letting a snake bite you. You don't want to just go out and find a rattlesnake and let's just see if we could get it to bite us and see how that feels. That's what it's like at, in the end. Not the beginning, in the end, that's what it's going to do to you. Verse number 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Perverse. That's perverted. Do you want to start saying perverted things? You know what you call someone who says perverted things? A pervert. A pervert. So here's a great idea, kids. Why don't you go out and get drunk tonight so people can call you a pervert because you're saying perverted things? Does that sound like what you want to be? Is that what you want to be known for? You want to be called a pervert because your mind's just saying perverted things? Because if you allowed this, this poison into your body that God has already warned you about, that it's just going to destroy your life. You know how many people go out and commit adultery and fornication just because they were drunk? Because their eyes start beholding strange women, and then they start getting perverted thoughts in their minds, and they go out and act on them because their inhibitions have been let down because they've allowed the booze to enter in their body? Amen. That happens all the time. You don't have to let it happen to you. Please, stay away from it. Verse 34, yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And that last phrase, or I'll seek it yet again, goes to the addictive nature of alcohol. Even though all of these things happen, your, 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 your heart's speaking perverse things, you're, you're, you're beholding strange women. You're, you're ending up waking up with wounds. How did that get there? I didn't feel it. I'm waking up. I've got bruises. I'm hurt. I got in some fight. I don't even know what happened. And then you wake up and you're going, hey, let's go out to the bar again tonight. It's an addictive cycle. And, and here's the folly. It's easy to spot the person who's already down in the gutter where you just say, I don't want to be that guy. That's easy. 
But you know what? That guy didn't start off going, I want to be the guy in the gutter. It always starts with just taking that first drink. Every, everybody starts off with just one drink. Don't start. Don't start down that path. Flip back to Proverbs chapter 2, Proverbs 23. We saw the, the warning about alcohol. And we also saw the, the Bible said a whore is a deep ditch. In the book of Proverbs, I don't know if there's another subject that, that has more verses dedicated to it than the strange woman. And especially for young people, okay, get this. This is extremely important. This, the, you know, this one thing, the booze, and, and just going after women that are just not right, people you shouldn't be going after, watch out for the warning signs, watch out for the traps, okay, because these will have long-lasting effects in your life. There are decisions that you make when you're young, oftentimes, that you will, I mean, obviously you can never change them once you make a decision, you can never go back on that. And with some of these things, you have to just deal with baggage for the rest of your life. Yeah, for the entire rest of your life. You may not think it's that big of a deal right now, and you're stuck with it forever. Look at Proverbs chapter 2, verse number 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee. And understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they froward in their paths to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words." which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteousness. So in Proverbs chapter 2, he's saying, you know, when wisdom entereth into thine heart, knowledge is pleasant, discretion is going to preserve thee. Being discreet, understanding knowledge, it's going to help you get through all this. Understanding is going to keep thee, and it's going to warn you about the strange woman. It says, even the stranger with flattereth with her words. Flattery is going to come up over and over again. So one of the warning signs to stay away from women who, who are just whores and adulteresses that are hunting for the precious life, one of the tactics they use is flattery. They're going to try to, to use their words to try to make you feel so special and so important when in their heart they're just seeking to, um, to be wicked. Turn to Proverbs chapter 5. And the reason why I started in Proverbs chapter 2 is because it gives us the end of going after the strange woman. You say, well, Pastor Bruce, what do you mean by a strange woman? Right? Well, there's two ways that you can understand this. One, if you're, if you're already married, a strange woman is going to be someone who's not your wife. If you know your wife, a strange woman is going to be any other woman. And if you're unmarried, look, a strange woman is someone who's not your wife. <laughs> so watch out for the strange woman. There's your two ways. <laughs> no, but obviously... Um, with the strange woman here to the one that's talking about a flatterer with her lip, lips, don't go after women who are not saved either. You need to be looking for people who are born again, children of God. You know, don't be just looking at the outward beauty of a person. You know, young people are looking to, to maybe think about getting married one day. You need to be looking inside at their heart, not just at the outward appearance. Uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ears to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, 
and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. So, you know, the strange woman, the woman who who's, has a wicked heart, is going to come to you, and they're going to say things that sound nice. So it's, oh, it, she drops as a honeycomb. You know, honey's sweet to the taste. Honey is something that's enjoyable that you want to have. And her mouth is smoother than oil, right? She's real polished and sounds nice, but it says her end is bitter as wormwood. You know, just like booze, booze might taste sweet, and you might find some, some wine coolers that just taste good. And you say, wow, this is great. But the end thereof is, is going to be like a serpent or like an adder. It's poison. But you, on the surface, it might taste good. But at the end, it's not good. It's the same thing with a strange woman. She's going to appear and, and say things that sound real nice. But don't fall. That's the trap. That is the trap of the strange woman, is to try to get you in with using fair words and trying to speak to you in a way that's going to attract you. The Bible says, her end is bare as wormwood, sharp as two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. This is strong language for a very important reason. Her steps, look, her steps take hold on hell. That's, I mean, how much lower can you get? Verse number six, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, and thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. This is just like alcohol. You know, look not thou upon the wine. Look, just avoid it altogether. These strange women, these, these, the, the whores that are out there that are going to try to seduce you, they're not going to church. They're not saved. They're not, they're not people that are, that are thinking about godly things. Watch out for the women that are going to say things to try to, you know, to flatter you, to tell you how great you are but their heart has nothing to do with the things of God at all. Watch out for that. Avoid it completely. Avoid it altogether. Have nothing to do with it. The Bible says, and say, you know, because at the last when you go down that, verse 12, and say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. When you're looking for a spouse, you're looking for someone to marry, you shouldn't just be looking on the outward. You know, if someone's just advertising their flesh and their body, that's not the person that you want. They should be, they should be ador you want to be looking for the, for the woman that adorns themselves with a meek and quiet spirit, with the things that are of high value in the sight of God, not with someone who's just worried about their physical appearance, and trying to attract you using their body. Stay away from that. And women, you, know, you want to attract a man, don't use your body to do it because you're going to attract the guys that are only interested in your body. And if your husband's going to be the one leading you in life, you don't want him just being led around with the, less of his flesh, the lust of his flesh. You want to attract a man that's a godly man then don't go showing off that, that part of you that, that, uh, that's going to attract the wrong person. Proverbs chapter 6. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 23. The Bible says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee, with her eyelids, for by means of a whorish woman a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. These people are out there. They exist. There's adulteress that literally are hunting for the Christian, the Bible believer, the one that's, that's trying to live a righteous life to try to take them down. Watch out for it. Don't lust after her beauty in your heart. 
Neither let her take thee in your eyelids. Verse number 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he, sat, if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For, the je for jealousy is a rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. What this is instructing us here is saying, you know, when you're messing with a married woman, someone that, that steals because they're hungry, right? Obviously, stealing's wrong. But if someone goes and steals some bread, you know, man, you know, I'm real hungry, I lost my job, I don't know what else to do. I'm going to go steal some food. Stealing's wrong, and you're going to have to pay for what you've done. But people have a better understanding of that and are willing to say, okay, well, you know what? You still got to pay it back, but they're not going to have the same attitude as if you lay with another man's wife. Because the person that you steal from, they'll be satisfied when you just pay it back and you restore it twofold or fivefold or whatever, the, whatever the, the punishment is. They'll be satisfied with that and say, fine, you, know, you shouldn't have done it, but it's done, it's over, it's settled. But when you lay with another man's wife, and it doesn't matter if she's the, the one that's the, the um, protagonist, it doesn't matter if she's the one trying to make things happen, if she's the whore going after you, look, the man's not going to be satisfied. There's not a amount. That's why the Bible says here, he will not regard any ransom. You know, it's not like you could say, oh, well, here, just, just take some money. He's not going to want that. He will not rest content, though thou givest him many gifts. That's why the Bible says, look, you can't take fire in your bosom and not be burned. You're messing with fire when you go after the, the adulteress. And you allow that to come into your life. You're going to get burned. And, and the Bible says jealousy is the rage of a man. He will not spare in the day of vengeance. People get killed. You, you could lose your life over something like that. For what? A, a fleeting moment of, of some, some fleshly lust and desire? Turn over to Proverbs chapter 7. Actually, I'm going to skip over that. No, let's cover it, Proverbs 7. This is, this is, this is too important to skip. We're almost done. Proverbs 7 gives us the, the most warnings of the strange woman, of the adulteress, that you need to be on the lookout for. Proverbs 7, verse number 4, the Bible says, Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. I don't want you void of understanding tonight. Don't be one of these simple ones. These simple youths that just, oh, I think I'll go over here. Oh, what's going on? It says, here, here's what he observed the, among the simple ones, right? The simple man, simple means kind of dumb, okay? Ignorant. They're simple. They don't understand. Verse number eight, passing through the street near her corner. We're going to see who her is in just a minute. And he went the way to her house. So here's a guy, he's just walking down the street and he's going by her corner, by her house, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. So he's already, it's, it's getting late. People the, that are, um, you know, a lot more wicked people, by the way, come out at night. Children of dark. There's a reason why Bible refers to people as children of darkness versus children of light. You know, you, you just need to be aware of that. Obviously, there's legitimate reasons to be out at night. I mean, the sun's going to be down by the time we get out of church tonight. There's, you know, you'll be headed home. But by and large, watch out. Bad things happen at night. You know, evil people try to use the cover of night to do their wicked deeds. People steal at night. People commit adultery at night. People do wicked things at night. So here we have a guy walking around in the middle of the night, walking by the, the strange woman's house near her corner. You know, who hangs out at the corners is the prostitutes. 
And, and look at this. The Bible says in verse number 10, And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Remember, we, we already referred to Amnon's friend, Jonadab. What was he? He was very subtle. Watch out for subtle people. The, the harlot here, she's subtle of heart. And it says here that she had the attire of an harlot. Ladies, if you're not a harlot, don't have the attire of an harlot. And I shouldn't have to point that out to you what that is. Just drive down the street here. Was it Van Buren, right? What are, what are the streets? Is that still been a few years? But, but isn't that the area downtown Phoenix where they have all the, 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 the prostitutes and stuff? I don't know. I don't recommend going down there. Just stay away from it. If you're one of the simple ones, you'll be going down there. Watch out for them, but you know what they look like. The people, they're, they're advertising their flesh. They're advertising their body. Wearing the attire of a harlot, verse number 11, she is loud and stubborn. Again, more attributes that you don't want to look for in a woman. Someone who's real loud and real stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. She's not a keeper at home. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. So this woman just approaches this guy, this simple guy, walking, just walking right by where he shouldn't even be at night, and she's like, oh, I found you. It's like, you don't even know me. And she's already starting to kiss him. And, and just tell him, oh, I've been, I've been searching just for you. It was like love at first sight when I saw you. Don't fall for this. Don't fall for it. Look, ladies or guys, don't fall for that. It's a trap. They're trying to, trying to make you feel real good and real special. It's like, well, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Why are you saying this to me? You don't even know me. How could you possibly say this? But the simple one is just going to go along with it. She caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said, I know I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Oh, wow, she's talking about spiritual things. She's talking, she must go to church. Well, that's okay then, right? No, watch out for that. Not someone who's just going to come up and just kiss you right away. There, and... and Wearing the attire of an harlot, look at verse number 15. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. Look, when a woman just meets you and she's starting to talk about her bed already, go the other direction. You want to have nothing, because you know what? You're not the first person. You're not the only person that she's done that to. Just a little bit of warning. Verse number 17, I perfume my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. People always want to try to downplay sin and wickedness by calling it something else. Instead of saying adultery, they say an affair, right? Or here, instead of talking about fornication or adultery, they're saying, oh, it's love. Well, if we love each other, look, and, 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 you know, hopefully the people in this room, you're not going to fall for just the, the whore that looks like a harlot. You know, hopefully you're well beyond that. But, but don't fall. Don't fall for the trap when you start dating someone and maybe you're both, you know, saved people, you're in a good church. Don't fall for this. Well, we're going to get married one day. Let's just have our love now. I love you, you love me, let's just, you know, we might as well, we, we could just do it now because we're going to get married anyways. Don't fall for that. It's fornication. The Bible says flee fornication, okay, and God is not going, you know, that can destroy your life. Because when you're not married to someone, that is off limits, mm -hmm. off limits, and you may think you can get away with it. You might be able to deceive your parents, her parents. You might think that, that everything's going to go just fine. But you know what? You cannot avoid God. And if you're born again, you better believe that God is going to come down and chasten you. 
And especially if you're growing up in a good church, you know, of whom much is given shall much be required. If you hear these warnings, you're hearing from God's word, you better believe and they better have the fear of God in your heart. You go down this path, God is going to rain down on you. You are not going to go unscathed and unpunished for falling into that. Watch out for that. Let's jump down to verse number 21. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. What's the Bible talking about? It's referring to traps, snares, giving you the warning. Watch out for it. No animal, no bird, if it knows there's a trap there, is going to go and be caught in the trap, right? That's why you, you hide them. That's why you set traps. You know, anyone who hunts and uses trapping to, to hunt animals, you don't just set it right out in the open where an animals going to be like, yeah, that doesn't belong here. <laughs> There's a reason why when you go fishing, if you're using a lure, what's a lure? It's a trap. It's got a hook on it. It's got a barb, right? Because you're trying to, trying to hook and catch that fish so it can't get away from you. You try to make, they try to make the lures look like other fish, look like it's something legitimate, something that the fish wants to go after. That's going to be a successful trap or snare. It's something that's going to look as close as possible to the real thing. You don't just, if you just put a hook in the water with nothing on it, you're not going to be a very successful fisherman. I'll tell you that much, because the fish are going to look at that and be like, that doesn't look like anything I want part of. You got to put a worm on it. You got to put something that, that is going to go after it. So watch out for the strange one. Watch out for all these things because the allure is going to be there. The appeal is going to be to the lust of your flesh. But there's a trap. It's a trap behind it. And it's going to hurt you and possibly even destroy you. That's the, the destruction is referred to here by this simple one. Verse 22, he goeth after straightways, an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver. As a bird hazes to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Don't think that you're above, oh, I'm strong enough. I'm spiritual enough. It's not going to affect me. I could go spend my time and hang around these areas where the, the, these strange women, these harlots hang out. It won't bother me. I could go to the bars and hang around with all these wine bibbers, and it's not going to impact me. Let him that thinketh he stand and take heed lest he fall. Look, there is, you are not above sin. I don't care how much Bible you've read and how long you've been in church. You need to set yourself up to not get involved in this wickedness. Verse 27, her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. Last point, beware of the slippery slopes of worldliness. You say, Pastor Burson, I'm well aware of this stuff and I'm already not going to get involved in the booze and in, in these strange women. And you know what? I hope so. Praise God. Like, please don't go down that. But don't go down the, the ways of worldliness. We covered some very serious sins. And I, and I wanted to make sure we cover the very serious sins and, and give emphasis to what the Bible's emphasized on things that are really going to impact your life. But you know what? When you open the door to sin, you can very easily slip down that slope way lower than you ever wanted to go. As soon as you start allowing things, allowing the worldly pleasures, saying, Oh, man, you know, as a kid, I grew up with all these rules. Well, I just want to know what it's like. I don't see why I have to have all these rules in place. You have the rules because your parents love you, because they're trying to follow God's commandments and trying to prevent you from making mistakes. Don't start opening up the door and allowing yourself to go down because you know what? You're going to start sliding, and you may not be able to stop yourself in time. Look at Lot. Lot was righteous. Lot's soul was saved. What happened? He pitched his tent towards Sodom, right? He didn't, he didn't start off going into Sodom. He just pitched his tent that way. He started looking at Sodom. Next thing you know, he's in Sodom. 
living right among them. And the Bible says, yeah, his soul was vexed, but he didn't move out, did he? No. He stayed right there among them. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. The Bible says in James 4, 4, Ye adulteresses and, adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Everybody can stand to learn from that verse. You want to just be friends with the world, friends with the ways of the world. You just Everything that the world does, you're fine with that. No big deal, no problem. It's all good. The Bible says you're the enemy of God. If you're going to be a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Let that sink in. When you start looking at the, the world's music, the world's entertainment, what the world has to offer. And it's, you know what? It's all at your fingertips these days. You've got a phone. You've got the internet. It's real easy to just plug right in. Again, you think nobody's looking. You think it's not going to be that big of a deal. Oh, I'll just check out this TV show. Oh, I'll just check out this music. Oh, I'll just start getting involved in this stuff. And you start enjoying and liking what the world's putting out, what the Sodomites are putting out, and you're pitching your tent towards Sodom. Watch out because you're going to slip. Yeah, yeah, I've heard this stuff before, but, but how bad can it really be? Don't learn by experience. Take the word of God and take the word of the people that do care about you. Take it to heart. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you love what the world's putting out, you don't love the Father. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Don't get wrapped up in the world. Don't allow yourself to just get sucked into the ways of the world. Look, we're in the world. It's all around you. You're going to have to deal with this for the rest of your life. But don't get sucked into it. I'm going to close with this verse in, first, in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You, I'm sure you've heard everything I preach on that. You've heard this before. There's nothing new. These are all real basic things. But you know what? To hear them again or for me to preach them again, for you it's safe. Let it sink in. Look, these are the things that are going to matter. Take it to heart. The Bible says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. You know, I believe when the Bible's talking about dogs there, it's talking about reprobates. It's talking about sodomites. Beware of them. Beware of that. Watch out. Beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Watch out for the, wicked, the wickedness out in this world. You're all going to have choices to make as you grow older. As I started off with this sermon, please don't blow off what you're hearing as, oh, he just doesn't understand, or... I could handle it. I can deal with it. I'm stronger than that. You know, Pastor Burzins is weak or whatever, but I'm strong. I can deal with it. Don't be foolish. Don't be a fool. Every young person thinks they're invincible at some point in their life. I thought I was invincible. You're not. Don't let that thought get to your head where you start making foolish decisions. Look, God loves you, which is why he gave you all this wisdom right here. I love you and care about you, and I don't want to see you fall either. That's why I preach a sermon tonight. I spent time thinking about this, meditating on it, and, and I, I really hope that it helps somebody 
here tonight to just stay with you and don't make the mistakes that so many other people have made. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for instructing us, God. I pray that you would please help these words to sink into our hearts, that, that we wouldn't just blow over them or, or start to feel like we've heard this so many times before and, and have this, this negative attitude of just kind of pushing it to the side and, and not treating it with the importance that, that you've given to it, dear Lord. Um, help us to, to make wise choices, dear God, and I pray that, that your words would just um, come back in our minds and would be in our hearts so that we can make good decisions in this lifetime, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.